Well, uh, I'd like to thank the Peaceful Planet Foundation for inviting me. I'm very honored to be a part of this. Uh, this is a very uh, um, passionate part of uh, my life. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm excited to be here and be a part of this wonderful uh, event that they uh, uh, put on. And I want to congratulate you guys for taking time out on your uh, uh, Saturday morning to do this. Um, uh, it really tells me that you are interested in your health and wellness. So uh, we'll get started. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about cardiovascular disease and nutrition, uh, how, how nutrition is related to your cardiovascular health. Uh, nutrition is key in the development of cardiovascular disease. And then conversely, then, you, if you think about it, nutrition is key in preventing cardiovascular disease. Uh, what, basically, what I tell people is we are what we eat. You know, it's, uh, it's in, you don't really think about it, but probably the most significant exposure and environmental exposure we get throughout the course of our lifetime is the food that we put in our body. We're doing it constantly, three times a day, four times a day. Uh, and it's so, it, when you start to think about it, uh, uh, it makes sense that it has a significant impact on our health. So a little bit about me. I don't like to talk about myself, but my wife makes me put this slide in. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a vascular surgeon. Uh, I grew up in the Dallas area. I've been uh, practicing vascular surgery for more than 20 years. I, I, my dad was a vascular surgeon, so it was kind of a, and me being a first generation American, it was kind of a, a natural thing for me to become a, a doctor and then follow in my dad's footsteps. Uh, I treat severe advanced atherosclerotic disease. Okay, of not of the heart, but of all the other arteries in the body. Uh, and so unfortunately, by the time people get to me, uh, uh, they've got bad problems, and I'll, I'll share some of that with you. Uh, typically, I do uh, bypass stents uh, and uh, 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 angioplasties, uh, but I also uh, treat patients with, uh, uh, I do the medical therapy for, for cardiovascular disease, uh, and one of the key elements of that is uh, plant-based nutrition, and I'll share that with you as well. So, uh, what we call, what we commonly call heart disease, it, it, medically, the medical term for that is atherosclerosis. Uh, athero means blood vessel, sclerosis means hardening. Uh, basically, it's the buildup of plaque on the inside of the arteries, uh, and then. The, uh, you know, in, in, in very simple terms, then whatever's downstream of where this plaque builds up then suffers the effects of the lack of blood flow. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into more details about that as well. Uh, here are some examples of plaque buildup. Uh, right, right here, this is an example of plaque buildup in the leg artery. And so whatever's downstream of the plaque buildup in the leg artery is going to suffer. And I often, one of the big things I treat is gangrene. Uh, of the foot uh, and trying to save uh, limb salvage is a big interest of mine. Uh, I put this slide up to kind of uh, drive home a point. This is uh, a very early signs of atherosclerosis. We call this fatty streaks. This is kind of moderate atherosclerosis where people begin to get symptomatic. And this is severe atherosclerosis where uh, it becomes limb threatening, life threatening, etc. cetera. Uh, but what I want to share with you is that we're seeing this uh, this starts, well, I'll tell you, uh, this used to start in the 20s, okay? Atherosclerosis is a slow, indolent, chronic process. So when somebody presents to me in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, it didn't just occur at that time. It's been uh, developing over the course of decades. Uh, and there's an interesting, there was an interesting study done in the 1950s on Korean war vets. They took uh, 300 consecutive uh, Korean war vets who had died and did autopsies on them and looked at their arteries, and in 77% of them, atherosclerosis was present. The, the, the shocking thing about this was that their average age was 22 years old. So by the time they were 22, nearly 80% of the people uh, looked at had atherosclerosis. Uh, and so another shocking thing now to, is that when I first started my practice, people presented in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Okay, so if they were starting this disease at, uh, in their 20s, uh, they were getting the, 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 symptom, the symptoms by their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now I'm starting to see people in their 40s uh, and even in their 30s. Uh, so it's, uh, it's starting to uh, occur earlier. And, and this has been shown in autopsies on uh, children. They're starting to see these, what we call fatty streaks in children. 
Uh, and so it's, uh, the disease is getting worse. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. And that's because it's what we're, we're doing to our bodies. So here I've got an example of a normal healthy artery uh, and a very diseased artery. Uh, a normal healthy artery, the arteries are not um, uh, just tubes. They're actually uh, uh, physiologic uh, ve vessels that uh, expand and contract and things come in them and go out of them. So they're very active. Uh, they have three la uh, layers. There's an external layer, uh, a middle layer, and an internal layer. Uh, and I bring up this internal layer. It's called the intima or endothelium. It's a one cell layer thick uh, layer. Uh, and uh, it's responsible for transport in and out of the arteries and also regulation of the artery as well, itself as far as uh, expansion and contraction. Uh, it releases a very important molecule that I, I focus on called nitric oxide, uh, which is a very powerful uh, vasodilator. Uh, it, it helps uh, reduce blood pressure. Uh, uh, it prevents atherosclerosis, and that's important uh, for later in the talk, remember that. Uh, so it's essential for arterial health. So why is atherosclerosis so bad? I think you guys are already probably getting an idea of this, but when atherosclerosis develops, uh, if it, it develops in your heart arteries, you get a heart attack, okay? Uh, if it develops in your arteries going to the brain, the, cerebro ves the cerebrovascular vessels, you can get strokes. Uh, and here's an interesting thing uh, people don't realize is that uh, dementia, most dementia is actually a vascular disease. Uh, we think about Alzheimer's, okay? But, and there's even thoughts that Alzheimer's, uh, a lot of Alzheimer's that's diagnosed is, is most likely vascular dementia. What happens is uh, uh, small micros microscopic infarcts occur in the brain due to uh, atherosclerosis. And then these occur over a long period of time and the confluence of all these events then leads to kind of a, a global dementia. So shield your eyes. Uh, I should have warned you before I did that. Uh, this is, what I, uh, this is a, the majority of what I treat. This is my specialty, limb salvage. Uh, I, patients come to me every day with this. And this is a result of the lack of blood flow to the foot. And uh, w they might be living with this for a long period of time, but then they get a cut or a scratch, a sore or a bug bite, and it doesn't heal. And the reason it doesn't heal is because they're not delivering oxygen. They're not able to deliver the white blood cells to fight infection. They're not able to deliver the nu nutrients uh, to uh, heal. And then if they're on antibiotics, right, not even able to get the antibiotics down there because there's not enough blood flow getting to the foot. Uh, so uh, th this patient uh, is, these patients are gonna lose some toes no matter what. But if I can't restore the blood flow, then they're going to lose their leg. And, and that's not uh, uncommon. There's over 200,000 amputations done in the United States on an annual basis. Now here's another interesting fact, impotence. Who here knew that impotence is a vascular disease? Not too many, but uh, I'm glad there are some. So people didn't, don't realize this. Uh, uh, blockages to the vessels in the pelvis limit blood flow and cause impotence, okay? Whether it's larger vessels or microscopic, like I've mentioned in the brain, um, or even in the foot, like, uh, uh, like earlier. And uh, so the impotence got a lot of attention when Viagra came out. Now, what is Viagra? It's a very powerful vasodilator, but it only works for a short period of time. And then you go back to your normal state where you have the blood vessel disease that uh, is uh, not allowing uh, the blood flow to the region. So it's in, uh, they say that 40% of men by the age of 40 have impotence, 50% by 50, 60% by 60. Uh, so it's a very real problem. So when men get impotence in their 40s, which uh, that sh that's a sign that they have atherosclerosis. They have it not only in their pelvis, if they have it in their pelvis, they probably have it elsewhere because atherosclerosis doesn't discriminate, okay? It, it affects arteries in the body everywhere. Oh boy. Well, what that, what that should say, that's uh, magnified, what that should say is not only does atherosclerosis lead to chronic debilitating diseases that cause pain and suffering, but it also leads to death. 50% of my patients, 50% of the patients that walk in my door for the first time are dead in five years. Okay, atherosclerosis is all over the body. I treat the peripheral arteries of the body, but they have it in their heart, they have it in their kidneys, 
Um, so they, uh, it's, a, it's a very serious disease. It, uh, and, and overall, atherosclerosis is the number one killer of Americans, and it's the number one killer worldwide. So how do you get atherosclerosis? Well, uh, it's, it's largely a lifestyle-related disease. This is the point I'm trying to get across to people. It's not something that's just going to happen. It doesn't just happen by accident. Uh, smoke, we know smoking was uh, highly related to atherosclerosis, but our diet is uh, one of the main factors. In fact, it's really the primary factor, and the reason I'll tell you why. In 1964, the Surgeon General put a warning label on cigarettes, and every year since then, smoking has declined in the United States. Okay, but every year since then, cardiovascular diseases still continue to get worse. Okay, and that's because our diet has gotten worse. Remember, I told you about the Korean War vets uh, and how the uh, at 22 years old, 80 percent of them had disease. Well, that was in the 1950s, and in the ensuing 70 years, our diet has gotten much, much worse. The standard American diet is bad, so we're causing worse and worse disease. Interestingly enough, in 1998, when I finished my fellowship, uh, we had elucidated the risk factors, what we call metabolic syndrome, uh, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, these things we knew were risk factors that were highly associated with uh, cardiovascular disease. And so as I was finishing up, I, I started to worry a little bit that I might have gone into the wrong uh, field because I thought, well, people are going to catch on to this idea and they're going to start changing the way they live and there's going to be less disease and I'm going to go out of business. I'm going to have to find something else to do. <laughs> so uh, uh, interestingly enough, I, there's three, in just the 20 years that I've been in practice, there's three times the volume of cardiovascular disease that there was in 1998. So it, uh, I, I, I didn't predict that one. And again, our diet has gotten worse and worse and worse, and people aren't listening uh, to what uh, the healthcare uh, people like us are telling them. So um, smoking and diet, there's people who out there who say, oh, it's, it's genetics. And I, I won't lie, there is some genetic aspect to it, but pure genetics is responsible for maybe 5 10% of disease, which has nothing to do with diet. Okay. The way I look at genetics is genetics might, uh, you know, people will say, my dad had a stroke, my mom had a heart attack, I'm destined to have it, my uncle had it, I'm destined to have it. And that's not necessarily the case. If, if, if you have that attitude and just kind of go on with the, the same way they lived, yeah, you, you may get it. But if you change what you're doing, uh, you, can, you can change, you can alter the pathway of your life. So the way I look at genetics is I say genetics may, may load the gun, but it's our diet that pulls the trigger. Okay. Um, uh, and, the, and, and that's the idea there is epigenetics. There's, we have our genes, but there's our environmental exposures. Epigenetics is what turns genes off, turns genes on, and affects processes in our body. Okay? Uh, and so uh, it, that's a very important point. We can control, uh, we can turn on many healthy genes, and we can turn off many unhealthy genes by what we put into ourselves. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so, but, and then what is it about our standard American diet? Uh, it's the cholesterol, it's the saturated fat, it's the processed foods. Uh, the traditional American diet is an inflammatory diet, it's an a a acidotic diet. So we're putting ourselves in this constant state which is ripe for the development of atherosclerosis. And I'm not going to get into the uh, uh, physiologic mechanisms, but, but just remember those ideas. Uh, so, as I said, uh, the, the, uh, the cholesterol and uh, saturated fats cause direct injury to that endothelium that I was talking to you about earlier, that single cell layer that lines the inside of the artery. Uh, and then when that injury occurs there, they get deposited in the wall. And then our body, the white blood cells in our body, specifically macrophages, try to go and clean up the situation. So they go and engulf the, uh, the plaque that's starting to build up. Uh, and, but unfortunately, that it's an inflammatory reaction that kind of gets out of control. And then, uh, so the plaque continues to build up, the, the, the white blood cells continue to go in there and fight, and you get the buildup of scar, fibrosis, and plaque in that area. And then you end up with that, that picture on the right that I showed you where the, the opening narrows down. But also what you end up with is no endothelium, 
Okay, so it's a catch-22. This endothelium that was regulating the blood cell, that was releasing nitric oxide, which is protective against atherosclerosis, is now gone. So you lose your protection against the atherosclerosis, so the atherosclerosis can get worse. All right, so it's kind of, it, it, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. Uh, and then the other diseases of our lifestyle, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, they all contribute to atherosclerosis as well. They, they kind of come in a nice little package. Uh, my patients typically have atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, and they're typically overweight, uh, and, they, and, and, and many of them have chronic kidney disease. So their body's they're very inflamed. So how do we currently treat atherosclerosis? Well, drugs and surgery. That's what our, that's what our society does. We throw pills at it uh, and we throw procedures at it. Uh, and uh, w what we're doing is we're managing diseases, but we're not curing diseases. It's, you know, if you take a pill for your hypertension, if you take a statin for your hypercholesterolemia, the, the, the hypertension and the hypercholesterolemia are not really truly going away. We're just managing them. If you stop taking that pill, they come back, okay? And so that, that's why this kind of chronic ma management of chronic disease doesn't reduce our risk that much. It doesn't improve our health. Um, we are throwing pills and, and, and uh, procedures uh, at cardiovascular disease, but cardiovascular disease is still increasing in, in, in uh, uh, prevalence, uh, and, and we're spending a lot of money on it. Our healthcare budget in, I think, 2016 was $3.2 trillion. Of that, several hundred billion dollars was devoted just to cardiovascular disease. It's projected that by 2025, our healthcare budget is going to be $6 trillion. As a society, we can't afford that. And so we've got to come up with a different way of dealing with cardiovascular disease. And I, I like to say these are stopgap measures. I say I'm, I'm plugging holes and I'm putting out fires, okay? I'm just busy uh, chasing the problem, but we're not doing anything about the problem. So is there a better way to treat and prevent atherosclerosis? And the answer is yes. Uh, I, here's another interesting story. In 1998, when I finished my fellowship, I was taught that atherosclerosis is a chronic, debilitating disease that has no cure, that all I can do is try to alleviate people's suffering by doing bypasses and stents, uh, but they're going to continue to have that disease for the rest of their lives. Okay. Um, uh, the interesting part about that is this gentleman, uh, Dean Ornish, Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, heroes, did some work in the 1980s. And what he did is he, he had two groups. He had a group of people where he managed their lifestyle, and then he had a group that continued to live the standard American diet. And when he managed their lifestyle, he did several things. He worked on health and wellness, uh, uh, and he did uh, a plant-based diet for these people. And what he showed is that over the course of the treatment, atherosclerosis actually regressed in the treatment group. He could make, he could make it go away, all right? Uh, and in the standard American diet, the atherosclerosis continued to worsen, as expected, all right? Um, uh, this was published in Lancet, one of the most prestigious journals in the, United, uh, in the world. It's actually from England. And yet, in eight years later, when I was finishing my fellowship, they still weren't teaching this. And actually, they're still not teaching this, uh, which is a real shame. Uh, so yes, atherosclerosis can be reversed, all right? Here's another, um, another uh, uh, important study by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Uh, he put uh, some patients on a uh, strict plant-based diet, diet and was able to reverse disease. And he actually showed angiographic, uh, these are pictures of the arteries on the heart. Okay, here's a patient with severe disease right there. And two and a half years later, that same artery, the disease is gone. This stuff was mind blowing to me. And I can't believe that they didn't teach it to me in, uh, in my vascular fellowship. So what changes did these people make to their lifestyle? So uh, these people were put on a whole foods plant-based diet. Uh, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, foods that are closest to their natural state, uh, green leaf, uh, they were uh, 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 given lots of green leafy vegetables. And the reason is because green leafy vegetables, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Oh no, where did it go? Okay, uh, green leafy vegetables 
uh, cause the body to produce nitric oxide. And remember that nitric oxide is that very valuable uh, molecule that's emitted or uh, secreted by the endothelium. So when we are producing atherosclerosis and our nitric oxide levels are not good, if you take in a lot of uh, green leafy vegetables, you can increase your nitric oxide level and help repair your arteries. So where, where do you get a lot of nitric oxide? Kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, uh, beet greens, uh, romaine. So green leafy vegetables. Um, I don't recommend eating a lot of spinach because uh, spinach is high, uh, high in oxalates and uh, you can get kidney stones from it. But uh, I, my, my favorite is arugula. It's actually the green that has the highest nitric oxide producing content. Um, and this diet was also high in uh, starches like potato, rice, whole grain pastas with limited nuts and seeds. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn actually eliminated nuts and seeds from his diet. Uh, and then minimally processed, minimally processed foods. So what did this diet not include? Well, it didn't include meat, okay? Didn't include dairy, didn't include eggs. And here's why, okay? Meat uh, is, uh, meat and uh, uh, dairy and eggs are the only source of cholesterol. Uh, plants don't have cholesterol, okay? So if you eliminate the cholesterol from your diet, your body, your body makes all the cholesterol it needs and your cholesterol typically will drop down into the 150 level, which is uh, consistent with no atherosclerosis. Uh, dairy is high in saturated fat. Uh, cheese is 70 to 80% fat. Eggs are extremely high in cholesterol. So what the diet also does include is uh, highly processed foods. Most processed foods uh, are, are not, they're not whole foods. They're not close to their natural state. They're stripped of their nutrients and vitamins. Um, they often have lots of extra added sugar and oils. Uh, and then the diet didn't include salt and no added sugar. So interestingly, uh, there are thousands of studies that have shown the hazards of the consumption of meat, dairy, salt, sugar, and uh, their deleterious effects on our body and our health. This one should say there are also thousands of studies that show the benefits of plant-based foods for our health. But there's no studies out there that show any, de any deadly effects of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Isn't this interesting? And, and yet look where our society is today. So I, I mentioned earlier about the Surgeon General putting a label on tobacco, uh, on cigarettes. It took over 7,000 studies documenting the deadly effects of uh, smoking before the Surgeon General finally declared smoking is bad for you. And, and we've known it, they've known it for decades, and yet the tobacco industry continued to deny it and, and put out disinformation and have their own scientists who uh, would deny the validity of these studies. Uh, but they eventually did. Um, and I find, I, I, fi I, I, I find that parallel happening today with our standard American diet. Uh, we, have, we know the deleterious effects of the diet. There are thousands of studies showing how bad meat, dairy, uh, and eggs are for us. There are thousands of studies out there that show it, and yet there's still controversy. There, the, the industries are still denying it. So I, call, I say today, meat is the new tobacco. So we are a pill-popping nation. There's a pill for everything, yet we are still a nation riddled with disease. When my patients present to me, uh, they spend the last 10 to 15 years of their lives miserable. They're on 10 pills. They're having multiple operations. They're spending all of their money. They're not, they're not enjoying the end of their life. Uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's an expensive and miserable way to go. Um, uh, medical debt, healthcare debt, is actually the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. Uh, and, and we're not really addressing the underlying cause of the diseases. And so it starts with changing the way we eat. So what does a typical day's menu look like? Okay, it's whole food, plant-based, as I alluded to. Uh, it's minimally processed. Uh, and there's a tremendous variety of foods. There's only six or seven meats that actually exist out there, right? But there's thousands of edible plants. So when I went plant-based, I, I started to introduce myself to a variety of foods that I never ate before. And we talk about eating the rainbow. There's you know, a variety of colors and uh, tastes and flavors. Um, but interestingly enough, just when people think that they're gonna miss out when they change their diet, but they're not. You can still eat all of the things that you used to eat, just prepared in a different and more healthy way. Here's some examples of whole 
plant-based foods, uh, legumes like beans, peas, lentils, chickpeas, uh, bulbs, uh, the, uh, the flowers like cauliflower, broccoli, artichoke, uh, a whole host of fruits, uh, stems, the green leafy vegetables, which is very important to me because of the, the nitric oxide, uh, roots, whole grains, mushrooms, uh, and nuts. And now I tell people to be careful with nuts. Only eat one or two ounces a day because they're high calorie, they're, they're uh, dense in calories. Here's some examples of uh, uh, breakfast. I won't belabor them. That just a nasi bowl, some waffles, uh, uh, pancakes. This is a beautiful cauliflower scramble, breakfast burritos. Uh, I eat. Uh, don't don't be a, don't be afraid of uh, starches. Okay, uh, I eat a baked potato three or four times a week. It's easy. It's quick. I can top it with uh, vegetables. I can top it with a lentil chili. Uh, you can make burgers and sandwiches. Uh, this is a, a Buddha bowl, which is a, a really nice mix. It's typically got a, a grain uh, and a uh, uh, a legume and uh, and a salad and then it's topped with vegetables. We still get to eat our pizzas, just no cheese and no oil. And snacks. Um, you got to change your snacks. Uh, you stop eating uh, potato chips and cookies uh, and start eating fruits. We snack on apples, oranges, blueberries, uh, it, and it all, just, it all starts with what you have available and what's close and easy for you. So I wanted to spend a second talking about nutrient composition. When you compare the standard American diet, which is an animal-based diet, versus a plant-based diet, uh, uh, look at the cholesterol. Again, I mentioned there's no cholesterol in a plant-based diet, one of the primary risk factors for atherosclerosis. An animal-based diet is very high in cholesterol. And then uh, it's, an animal-based diet is very high in fat, and I, I would venture that that's mostly saturated fat, which is also the bad kind of fat. Whereas a plant-based diet ha has a little fat, and we all need fat. Okay, we do need about 10% of our calories from fat, but uh, the fat in a, a plant-based diet is mostly uh, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. There are a few plant-based uh, things that have uh, saturated fat, and I tell people to try to typically avoid that. Uh, look at this. People wonder about protein in a plant-based diet. Well, this is a 500-calorie meal, so it actually, the plant-based, it's a higher volume for the plant-based uh, meal, but five, if, if you're eating 500 calories of food, uh, it typically gets you the same amount of protein. So uh, there is no such thing. I've never seen protein deficiency in vegans and plant-based people. It just doesn't exist. People always ask that, but it doesn't exist. I don't know why they ask it. Uh, it's probably because uh, the disinformation that's put out there has caused people just to Im immediately think that you can't get protein on a plant-based diet. But there's protein in every plant, and then some have more than others. Here's, here's really and a very important thing. There's no fiber uh, in meat uh, and lots of fiber in a plant-based meal. And I'm gonna address that a little bit more. And then look at this, vitamin C, iron, calcium, beta carotene, vitamin E, folate, magnesium. Look at how much there is in a plant-based meal and how little there is in an animal-based meal. Uh, the people who are eating uh, keto, paleo, et cetera, um, I think are running the risk of becoming uh, deficient in many of these things uh, unless they do something to fortify and supplement uh, many of the vitamins and minerals. And then this doesn't even uh, talk about uh, antioxidants and phytonutrients. You don't get those in, a, in, a, uh, in an uh, animal-based meal, uh, and you get lots of antioxidants and phytonutrients in plants. And why are those important? Well, uh, uh, our body is constantly creating uh, oxidative stress and creating free radicals, and these antioxidants fight those free radicals because those free radicals are injurious to our body. And then antioxidants, uh, are, I mean, phytonutrients are extremely important. Uh, there's thousands of ty different types of phytonutrients in, in plant-based meals, and, and they're important in fighting cancer. Okay. So I told you I would address fiber. Uh, there's fiber in every plant food. Uh, and uh, so, uh, or w let's talk about fiber. Nine, when they, they, they ask whether somebody who's plant-based is protein deficient, well, the reality is we should be asking the, the standard American diet eaters are you fiber deficient? And the reality is more than 90% of Americans are fiber deficient. 
I've actually seen numbers as far as high as 95%, 97% of Americans. And most Americans get about 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day. The absolute minimum recommendation is 25. And my feeling is people should get 40 to 50 grams of fiber a day. And that, if you're eating a plant-based diet, uh, that's not hard to achieve. But when you're eating a standard American diet, you don't get it. And, that, uh, and that's why our society is uh, riddled with digestive problems, why we have so much colon cancer. I just read a report yesterday that colon cancer is on the rise in, in younger people. It's continuing to get worse. So what, what else does fiber, what does fiber do? It helps bind and eliminate toxins. It helps bind and eliminate cholesterol and fats. It makes you feel full and satiated when you eat. It's also a prebiotic, and what does that mean? It means that it feeds our gut bacteria. It makes our gut bacteria healthy, and it helps promote a, health, a healthy mix of gut bacteria. And it's, it's really becoming more, more evident that our gut is an extremely important organ for every process in the body, especially our immune system. Uh, and I, my feeling is that we're gonna really, really consider it the most important organ in the body, and that has, uh, including the gut bacteria that we have with it. So there is no fiber in animal products. Here's another uh, uh, thing I'd like to talk about, which is calorie density. Uh, if you look at that red line, uh, to the left of that red line is plant-based foods. To the right of that red line is animal-based foods, except for nuts and seeds. Uh, if you stay on the left side, of this, oh, uh, let me go back. Most Americans eat three to five pounds of food a day. So when you take that into account, these are calories per pound. So if you eat five pounds of these foods, uh, you get uh, a nutrient dense diet and you can fill yourself up and you're not getting an excess of calories, okay? When you eat these foods and you eat three to five pounds of them, you get uh, calorie excess, uh, you get a nutrient deficiency uh, and you don't fill yourself up so you have to eat more of it, okay? And that's why we are an obese society today. Two out, of three every, two out of every three Americans are overweight. One out of three are cl clinically obese. Only one in three Americans are uh, uh, no, of normal weight. And, but when you look at, uh, and what is the population of Americans with the most normal weight? It's the vegan population. They ha they're the ones that have a, a normal uh, uh, weight and, B and BMI. This is another way to look at calorie density. Starting over here on the right, this is uh, what uh, three tablespoons of oil does to you. It doesn't fill your stomach up, uh, and uh, uh, it's calorie dense, and it has no nutrients. Uh, here's 400 calories of cheese, 400 calories of uh, meat. So again, you're going to want to continue to eat to fill yourself up. But look at 400 calories of beans, grains, and potatoes, and 400 calories of fruits and vegetables. You get full. You get satiated. Uh, and you can, eat, you can actually go and eat again later because you only got 400 calories. Um, I tell my patients that they can eat, I don't restrict them, they can eat all the fruits and vegetables they want uh, until they're full. Uh, I, I've had one patient who took, me, took that to heart and they, they started eating fruits and vegetables all the time. They lost weight uh, and they got better and, uh, and they, felt, they felt better. So I wanted to spend a second talking about carbs. Carbs have been demonized in our society. And the reason I spend some time talking about this is because a plant-based diet is a carbohydrate-based diet. We were meant to, our bodies were meant to run on carbohydrates. Uh, and so how have carbohydrates been demonized? Well, people think of the stuff on here on the right side as carbohydrates. Candy, soda, pastries, uh, sugary cereals, white rice, white flour, white breads. Uh, and, and, and those are carbs, but those are processed foods. They're not whole foods. They've been stripped of their nutrients. They are pretty much, you're pretty much eating pure sugar, okay? And that's not the kind of carbs we eat in a whole food plant-based diet. The kind we eat are fruits, green leafy vegetables, starchy veg, uh, things. And there, I, I've even had people who want, went whole food plant-based but still didn't want to eat starchy stuff because they were scared they still had that thing. But you can eat all the starches you want. Beans, whole grains, corn, uh, pastas made from whole wheat uh, and alternative pastas like uh, made from brown rice, lentils, quinoa, chickpeas. So is this change of lifestyle difficult? It can be. I mean, it's not, you can't just do it overnight. You can't just snap your fingers and say you're going to do it. Uh, it takes some planning. Uh, you know, unfortunately, our society has a lot of habits, traditions, uh, culture, and social pressures. There's a lot of political forces at hand uh, that are keeping us 
uh, on the standard American diet. Um, I think a social support system is extremely important. That's why this occurs, and that's why what the Peaceful Planet Foundation is doing is so wonderful. Uh, people can come to things like this and learn. I tell people to do your research, do your reading. There's plenty of information out there. Uh, uh, read, uh, uh, read the books and the, the articles, watch the documentaries, uh, and, uh, uh, and learn. And, uh, and uh, arm yourself with the information you need first. Okay, uh, learn how to make some, uh, some uh, uh, dishes that are plant-based, introduce them slowly and get other ones out and, and make a transition over time. So uh, we learned most of our knowledge about eating from TV and advertising. Uh, and I, I think this is very interesting. You, you know, we all, we all heard of these things, meat, it's what for, what's for dinner. It's a jingle, but uh, you know, uh, got milk, right? The Incredible Edible Egg, uh, Have It Your Way, I'm Loving It, uh, Where's the Beef? That was my favorite one growing up. Uh, I used to go to Wendy's a lot. Um, this one's interesting, uh, The uh, Incredible Edible Egg. There was a time when the egg industry wanted to advertise that eggs were healthy, okay? And the USDA objected to that. They said, you can't say, there's no, there's no studies proving that. So instead, they came up with this jingle, The Incredible Edible Egg, and, and the USDA probably did them a favor because uh, it, it's stuck in our mind, right? They've probably sold lots of eggs because of it. So, uh, who knew that meat causes cancer? Well, it does. The World Health Organization in 2016 classified processed meats such as bacon, sausage, hot dogs, pepperoni, uh, deli meats as a class one carcinogen. But they're still selling it, so it's just like tobacco, right? And there's no warning label on it. We're still feeding it to our kids in school. Okay, uh, I applaud uh, New York City. New York City just uh, eliminated, uh, the, no more processed meats are gonna be served to the kids in the New York City schools that just passed recently. But that's a far cry from the, you know, what, what really needs to happen. So they're classified as a class one carcinogen and red meat in general is classified as a class two carcinogen. But what does class one carcinogen mean? It, it means that they may, it doesn't mean that they may cause cancer, it means it does cause cancer. We have definitive proof, hundreds and hundreds of studies out there that show that processed meats cause cancer, okay? Well, uh, this puts them in the same class as plutonium, asbestos, and tobacco. Those are also class one uh, carcinogens. What if I said, uh, what if I passed a, a teaspoon of uh, uh, asbestos around the room and told you guys to eat it? You wouldn't do it, okay? Or if I asked you to sleep next to a nugget of plutonium, you wouldn't do that, right? Uh, somebody commented to me one time, and I, th I thought it was great. They said, but if you disguise it as bacon, they'll eat it, right? Uh, and so we need to start thinking of uh, bacon in the same way we do asbestos and, uh, and plutonium and tobacco. So no one is getting rich from, eating, from you eating a potato and a bowl of fruit. Uh, one of our famous colleagues says, uh, there's no big broccoli lobby, no, you know. Uh, there is the tobacco lobby, the meat industry, the dairy lobby. Uh, there's uh, people out there spending hundreds of millions of dollars to convince us to keep eating the way we're doing, uh, but there's, there's no one pushing for us to change our diet. So uh, how did I get here, okay? I had both a personal path and a professional path. Uh, my personal path is I've always been interested in uh, my own health. Okay, I, and I was, I've been always exercise, run, lift weights. In, in my 40s, um, I started doing P90X. Everybody heard of P90X? Uh, and Tony Horton uh, stressed that even though it was an exercise program, that nutrition was 80% of the game, okay? And I did focus on my nutrition, and I, I was doing what I thought was right. I was eating a high protein, high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Uh, and, uh, and I did that for several years uh, but interestingly enough, my cholesterol was high. It was over 200. My triglycerides were high. My blood pressure was in the upper 130s, which uh, at that time was considered normal because the, the number was 140, but today would be considered hypertension. Uh, and my blood sugar was borderline high. So despite me being extremely active, I was running and exercising six times a week. I was eating what I call, considered a strict healthy diet. I had all these things, these signs of disease starting to creep into me in my 40s, and these are the things that present, uh, this is when it happens in, in our population, by the time people are 50, 
uh, they're going to the doctor and being treated for all these things. I would have been probably put on an anti-diabetic pill, a hypertension medication, a cholesterol medication. Um, and uh, then fortunately, my wife around that time uh, drugged me to see Rip Esselstyn give a talk. Uh, from there, I watched Forks Over Knives, and then I learned about the China Study, which is a book uh, by T. Colin Campbell. Uh, and then I read the work of Dean Ornish and, and, and uh, Dr. Esselstyn, and I was blown away. Uh, and I, I found out that I, I wasn't eating right. I changed the way I was eating. I found out that uh, atherosclerosis didn't have to occur and could be treated uh, and reversed. Uh, so personally, I changed the way I ate. Uh, but also professionally, my professional path was uh, that uh, I had become a little bit frustrated with my patients. I called them repeat offenders. Okay, They kept coming back. Uh, they, uh, I, I would do an operation of stent or an angioplasty, and then a year later, they'd be back again with more disease. And they would look at me like I didn't fix them. Okay, Like it was my fault. Okay, But what I fixed was fixed and more disease is coming back in other places. And I, it's not unusual for me to treat the same patient four or five or six times until I chop off their leg, okay? Uh, and uh, the, uh, the frustration also was that I was seeing that these patients were sick. They were, as I told you earlier, they're spending the last few years of their lives uh, uh, miserable. They're busy dying, not living. Uh, they're spending all their money. And so professionally, I wasn't satisfied because I wasn't changing uh, the trajectory of their life. Uh, and so th there was a confluence when I learned about uh, plant-based nutrition, and I began to teach that in my practice also. So not, uh, I, had, I had to live, a, and I'm, I'm glad that I decided to live a certain way too because I wanted to live what I preached. Okay, so that's how I got there. Um, this, this is what I was doing. Uh, I was mopping the floor. This is, Dr. Dean Ornish came up with this cartoon. Uh, this is what the doctors are doing. We're mopping up the floor but we're not taking care of the problem. We're not turning off the faucet, the, the source of the problem. So I'm gonna wrap this up for you in a pretty little package. Um, cardiovascular disease uh, is the leading killer of Americans and people worldwide. It kills 650,000 Americans annually. Uh, and that's just how many it kills. We do millions of procedures on people as well. There's 140,000 strokes annually. I treat strokes. I'm a, uh, uh, the, uh, a great deal of strokes are due to blockages in the carotid arteries. My patients tell me they would rather die than have a stroke because uh, having a stroke leads to uh, a severe stroke leads to significant morbidity. Uh, they don't want to be uh, bedridden. They don't want to be cared for by their family. They have to be clean, cleaned and fed by their family. It's not a good way to live. Okay. There's 200,000 amputations annually. You put those, just those three morbidity, mortality, death, and, and sickness together, that's a million incidents right there, just from those. Uh, dementia is in the millions. Impotence is in the millions, okay? So this is a far-reaching disease. Uh, I didn't even talk about kidney failure today. So after our, to summarize, after our 50s, we're busy dying. We're not busy living. Uh, we all have atherosclerosis to some extent due to our diet and lifestyle. And now that you know this, what are you going to do about it? Thank you. So I don't, are we gonna take questions now? Okay, so, oh. All right, yes, his hand went up fast. How do we uh, find someone like you in Houston? Okay, um, right there. She's my hero, Dr. Chawla. Uh, so uh, I, I was just telling her earlier, I wish she was in Dallas because I would send patients to her left and right. Yes. Okay. We also have a we also have a cardiologist here, and and she'd be a great resource. But Dr. Baxter Montgomery is a cardiologist who uh, is very good at managing uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, Green. Yes. Well, I, I, you know, so just yesterday I spoke at UTMB in Galveston. Uh, so there are many of us who are trying to impact uh, our, our healthcare field at a younger age. I was very encouraged. 15% of the medical students turned up for this talk. It was elective. So, you know, I, uh, that's, that's, 
That's 15% more than did it when I was in medical school. So there's gonna be, I think it's, it's, it's gonna grow, it's gonna change. People are aware, plant-based nutrition is in the news a lot, okay? And uh, so uh, there are a lot of people working, you know, at, at a gra it's gotta happen at a grassroots level, okay? We can't rely on the government and business to do it. And then once it becomes, once there's a momentum, then business will pay attention to it because they're gonna wanna cater to that crowd, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, because I'm trying to get calories. Yeah, then you could probably you could probably eat a little bit more. But uh, when I when people want to increase their weight, I tell them there's that slide um, that uh, showed the uh, the red line. I uh, this one right right there. I tell people to eat more legumes. That's that's a, high, a good protein source. And uh, you, uh, you know, chickpeas, lentils, beans. Focus more on that because uh, it's the higher calorie. Uh, you can eat lots of potatoes and starches, and and you should be able to put on some weight. I mean, we uh, we're very good friends with a uh, a competitive bodybuilder in Dallas uh, who's won championships, uh, and he has no problem putting on weight and and protein. Yes, sir. It does not have cholesterol, but it, there are oils. I mean, that's a good source of fat in our diet, actually, is nuts and seeds. That's why I encourage one to two ounces a day. Um, but I, I, another example, I, I had a friend who worked out regularly, uh, and she ate. Uh, she told me she ate uh, uh, nuts and seeds for health because they're a healthy uh, food. Uh, and, and, but she came to me and said, but I'm not losing weight. I'm still kind of heavy. It turned out she was eating seven, eight, or nine ounces of nuts a day. Okay, so she was getting lots of calories from, uh, from there. So um, I, I just advise people to eat it in moderation. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so avocado is another good source of uh, healthy fat. Okay, there's a fair, uh, but also has fiber and protein in it. Uh, when uh, when uh, we, we do need fat in our diet, we should get about 10% of our calories from fat. And so we should get fat, our fat from whole foods like avocados and nuts um, and seeds because along with the fat comes the fiber and the phytonutrients, the minerals, the vitamins, uh, the antioxidants. So it's kind of the complete package. And so our body absorbs it and regulates it differently than if we were just eat a, a high fat processed food. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, Brazil nuts. There's a study, uh, just a single study. Yeah. Uh, the Brazil nuts. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I eat four Brazil nuts once a month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it can't, you know, it, I don't know that it can't, it can't hurt you. Yes. Is the way I look at it. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I do. I do. I, I think I see a momentum occurring. Uh, I, I admire so many of the leaders in our field, like Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn, these people who have continued to preach that message for decades, and yet there was no movement. The needle wasn't moving. But now we're starting to see this thing. You're starting to hear about it. Uh, more and more people are becoming plant-based. Uh, so I think it's kind of like a snowball rolling downhill. We're still at, closer to the top of the hill, but it's starting to happen. Yeah, I'm hopeful. So, you know, I don't personally advocate for that. Um, I think everybody's gonna settle out where they want on how much. The fish is still a meat. Uh, there's still cholesterol in it. And there's other, there's other disadvantages of eating meat. Uh, I talked just about the cardiovascular effects today, but uh, from the overall health and cancer causing issues, uh, there's other deleterious effects of meat. Um, and there's also some pathways for atherosclerosis from meat that I didn't discuss. 
like choline, uh, which there's a choline carnitine pathway that causes TMAO, which leads to atherosclerosis. Uh, so I don't advocate for meat. Um, now, but I, I also don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't teach people to eat, it's all or nothing, okay? What I want people to do is eat, be healthier. I want them to introduce more fruits and vegetables in their diet and eat less meat. Uh, and if somebody comes to me and say, I still eat, I'm 95% I'm plant based, I'm gonna be happy for them. All right. Okay, guys. Thank you very much.